Welcome to the Cambridge Health Alliance Health as well. My name is Roberta Robinson. I'm Director of Marketing and Outreach for the Geriatric Division of the Cambridge Health Alliance. Today we have Dr. Michael Payne, who is a gastroenterologist. Welcome, Dr. Payne. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. He always has so many fascinating and interesting things. We look at the insides through Dr. Payne's eyes, which I think is very exciting and fascinating for me. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, your kind words. And um, uh, when last I was here, you asked me if I would talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the microbiome, which is a fancy way of saying the organisms that live inside of us. You know, the human body is made of about 40 trillion cells, which is a lot of cells. A lot of cells. Uh, I'm sorry, 30 trillion cells. But we actually carry around 40 trillion, that's uh, 10 trillion more bacteria in our bodies both inside and on our skins. I mean, in a sense, we were talking before the uh, uh, filming started and about your trip to the Brazilian rainforest. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our bodies are just as complex as the Brazilian rainforest. We are, in fact, an ecology. Every human being is like their own ecological zone. There are different parts of the body that have different ecological uh, 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 landscapes. For example, your stomach have secretes an acid, which discourages bacteria from growing, and yet there's a bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, that loves growing in the stomach because it has, from an evolutionary uh, uh, creation of tricks, developed a coat of ammonia that protects it from the acid. Ammonia and acid, when put together, make water, and uh, it sort of neutralizes the effect that the acid has on this bacteria. So it and its its children live very happily in your stomach, where they can cause ulcers. Right, that's not so happy. And they can also lead to, eventually, causing stomach cancer. Really? In fact, one of the, the great moments in medicine was realizing we could not only cure ulcers, but diminish the number of people who got stomach cancer by treating these bacteria with antibiotics. So there's a test for it, is it? Yes, there is. There's a blood test, there's a stool test, and if we do an endoscopy, say, to treat an ulcer, we can take a biopsy and actually look at it under a microscope or culture it. Um, the uh, reality is H. pylori is just one bacteria that lives like a nomad in the desert where no other bacteria wants to live. You don't have a whole lot of bacteria in your small intestine, for example, because it's sort of like living in a super San Francisco. I mean, there's an earthquake every 20 minutes, and that grumbling sound that you hear, which, by the way, is perfectly normal, it's just air being pushed into your intestine, that grumbling sound uh, sort of is a signal that your intestine is moving things along. The reason it does that is that bacteria kind of like things to be still and quiet, like in a stagnant pool. So if it's being jostled by these huge earthquakes from the bowel, not such a great place to live. Um, your colon is a different story. Your colon is an organ, it's about five feet long, and uh, from the colon is the anus and out. And the major function of the colon is to reclaim all of the liquid that you use to kind of lubricate whatever it is you ate. Remember, when you eat something, you create saliva, bile, pancreatic juice, stomach acid, and all that stuff is basically based in water. Well, that's a lot of water. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't get it back, you would wind up being dehydrated. So your intestine reabsorbs that water, but the last two liters of water in your colon is responsible for getting back. Uh, and so it kind of mixes it back and forth for about two days, um, which is a fairly long period of time. Uh, needless to say, that fluid has lots of nutrients in it, and bacteria love it. So your colon actually has more bacteria than there are probably bird species in the Amazon. I mean, it's an incredibly diverse place with literally trillions of organisms that live there on a day-to-day -day basis. I said they're about 40 trillion bacteria that live in your body. It depends on whether you've been in the bathroom or not, because you've got that population down right away. But here's the thing. Or a, it could be increased. Uh, it, it could be increased as well. Right? Yeah. Right. Or you could get the wrong kind of bacteria living there. It's sort of uh, like being in uh, you know, Hopkins Forest. I mean, you, you would love to see birds and bluebirds and, and robins and you know squirrels, but you really don't want to run into a Bengal tiger. Well, some bacteria act like Bengal tigers. They are, or some bacteria, worse than that, act like human beings. They literally strip mine the intestine for nutrients. Uh, C. difficile is a bacteria oh, that does that. C. diff. 
We yeah. get that when we're on uh, an extended period of antibiotics. Is that one reason? That's the reason. And the yeah. reason that happens is that, so imagine the spores, the, you know, Snow White lives in and the birds are there and the little squirrels and rabbits and you know, it's a beautiful place and all of a sudden there's this just toxic Agent Orange dropped on the forest. So squirrels, birds, just drop over dead. And in this paucity of the normal bacteria that are supposed to live there, that live in harmony with our bodies, these biker, you know, killer bacteria move in, you know, uh, the Clostridia gang is pretty bad. The Clostridia family of bacteria include Clostridia tetani that causes tetanus, Clostridia botulinii that causes botulinism, that causes botulism, uh, and Clostridia perfringes that causes like severe gangrenous wounds. And then of course you have Clostridia difficile that when it moves into the intestine, it's not interested in living in harmony. It basically just kills cells and eats them. Mm. And this is why treatment for all there is treatment for all of these. There is treatment for so these that's, various it's encouraging. for these uh, various bacteria uh, things. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, don't eat food out of cans that have bulges in them, which is the old sign for botulism. But mm -hmm. for uh, C. difficile, the uh, you don't use antibiotics unnecessarily. But if you have to use them, then um, you need to be careful if people get this infection. It is treated with uh, antibiotics that are designed to kill this particular bacteria, specifically mycomycin. Uh, we uh, is, it, is it common within the elderly population? It is, but it's seen most commonly in healthcare institutions, like in hospitals, where the bacteria hangs out. I mean, in many people, they have it in their uh, body already as a spore that just sort of lives there, a conventional uh, that will take advantage if given a chance. But the most common source for this bacteria is being in contact with people who are in nursing homes or in hospitals, which is why nursing homes and hospitals take such great lengths to try to keep things clean. Right. Uh, but we're talking about organisms that are so small you could fit literally billions of them in a, uh, uh, a period in a, on a newspaper, uh, you know, the end of the newspaper sense. So this is one of the organisms we have to just learn to live with. And I think one of the things we were talking about earlier is uh, the philosophy of uh, healthcare and of just living, which is we live in this fascinating, intricate world that has many dangers in it. There is no danger-free road, so you use common sense and you do the best you can to avoid problems. You cannot avoid bacteria. That's just uh, you are made out of bacteria in part. Um, you know, there are more bacteria in your body than there are your own cells. <laughs> But your own cells manage to have a pretty decent relationship with most of them. Uh, people who take cleansing enemas, for example, that, that I, I am sorry, but as a gastroenterologist, I am really not very much in favor of that because one, uh, there is a risk of perforating the intestine, which can lead to problems. The inside of your colon has trillions of bacteria. The inside of your body, once you get past that colon wall, is sterile. There are no bacteria. And your body works really hard to keep it that way. So when you create a conduit, a hole, a fistula, or a perforation, and those bacteria can get into your body, that's a bad day. So when you talk about the cleansing enema, do you mean a colonic? Is that uh, what you're talking about? is one expression for it. Uh -huh. uh, the, uh, the other problem is it doesn't make sense if you're a colonocyte, because if you're one of the cells that makes the colon, the inside lining cells, guess where you get your nutrition from? Uh, it's sort of like you know that old I Love Lucy cartoon where people with you know Lucy and Ethel uh, would eat uh, uh, candy. Chocolate factory. Yeah, the chocolate factory. They would eat chocolates off the line. That's what the cells in the colon do. They get most of their nutrition from the fecal strain because it, it is made disgusting to you and me. And there's an evolutionary reason why we find the smell and the appearance of feces to be disgusting. It is so that we don't eat it. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an evolutionary step forward <laughs> that helped improve our diets tremendously. Something that dogs have not yet evolved through. Uh, what is your dog doing to my cat? Oh my goodness. Uh, the uh, reality is you're supposed to have feces in your colon. It's supposed to be there and it nourishes the colonocytes and cleaning it out isn't helping your body. It doesn't make you healthier. Okay. And it can actually hurt you. Now, there are times people need enemas, but that's under very special medical conditions, not as, not, a, as a not as a means of trying to promote health. And if you have an issue with having feces in you, we are not talking about a medical problem. We are talking about an aesthetic problem, and that's a different that's a different discussion. Okay. But anyway, you've got these uh, 
expect, right? And yes, people worry about GMI stooling enough, et cetera. Well, we consider normal uh, anything from three stools a day to one stool a day, um, anything in that range. You, by the way, don't have to stool every day. Uh, you know, uh, people become constipated. Most common cause of constipation is you don't drink enough water. Right, uh, because know. I know they don't like to drink because there'll be frequent visits to the restrooms and, and people have an aversion to that. So they restrict their water. Yeah, don't do that. I know, it's yeah. not a good thing. It's, it's a really bad thing. And Because all this water that you were talking about, as it leaves us, we need to replenish that. Yeah, and the reality is that most waste is uh, expelled from the body, not through feces. That's basically stuff you don't want in bacteria that are hanging on because it's expelled through your kidneys, which you really want to keep working. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to drink an appropriate amount of water. And for most people, by the time you're thirsty, you're already significantly dehydrated. Oh, that's interesting. So, so, so the recommendation is about 64 ounces a day? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, I would say serving a full glass of water with every meal and you know two or three extra glasses on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have kidney disease and you've been told something different, that when you're on dialysis, that's a different story, but for the average person, obviously on a hot day, you can drink through a gallon of lemonade, you know, a few minutes, but uh, the important thing is to stay hydrated. I keep using water. I don't have a problem with milk for low calorie, if you're an adult, uh, or low fat milk. Uh, I don't have a problem with, uh, 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 you know, tea or coffee in moderation, moderation being one or two cups a day, beyond that, yeah, that's not a good idea. Uh, but I think that uh, fruit juices, etc., depends on who's drinking it. If you're uh, an adult and you have reached the age of 30 where you know, your basic metabolic rate starts to slow, you start to put on weight. And a great place to cut excess calories is not to drink flavored fruit juices. Mm -hmm. I'm not a great fan of flavored waters either. I mean, you know, I do drink some. The sugar substitutes they use actually, well, they play with the metabolism. They just trick your tongue into thinking, oh, it's sweet, which we love. The problem is also tricks the body into thinking, oh, it's sweet, which triggers hunger. And that's where we get into the... So that's an interesting thing. Yeah. But I, and I, you know, I found that, uh, for the most part, I've eliminated flour, white flour and sugar from my diet. And, and in doing that, I find that the cravings have gone away. And I've also eliminated all the sweeteners, because I found that the, having the sweetness just made you crave more sweet. Now again, there are people who are on very specific diets and need to have these things, but I've gotten into this period of my career where I, I call common sense medicine. Mm -hmm. Food is a good thing, and we need to eat it. We used to use common sense and a few facts. Um, first and foremost, our species survived for millennia without processed foods. Right. Probably okay to eat things like fruits and vegetables that are fresh. Uh, Bat, I mean fish, uh, chicken, uh, meat products, we've eaten those. We are omnivores. We're not, by nature, as a species, herbivores or carnivores. We eat pretty much anything that's, if it's alive, we are more than happy to convert that life form into our life form. Um, the uh, problems that we face as we get older, and we're very fortunate to face these problems, uh, obesity is sort of a hangover to the fact that uh, for Thousand, our species is about 200,000 years old. Uh, for most of that time, we lived on the verge of starvation. And so our bodies evolved to suck calories up wherever they could find them. Mm -hmm. We also had these incredible drives that kind of grew into our species to seek out things which were sweet and salty and fatty because those were things that were great sources of energy and uh, survival and you need to replenish salt or you die from you know, salt deprivation, mm -hmm. which is why salt was used in ancient civilizations as a currency. Right. Hence the expression, work their way in salt. Huh? Or uh, they, they're not worth their way in salt. Um, the things we find out on the show. The, um, the thing that uh, happened is that we got really successful about when the agricultural revolution came uh, about 5,000 years ago at creating food and food stores. I mean, we're really good at like making food, and uh, we've gotten better and better as time goes on. You know, with the creation of uh, uh, fertilizers, uh, artificial nitrates, and stuff. So, right now in human history, food is in abundance, and you know, you can walk five steps from this place, and you'll find a place that serves food or sells food. So we don't have a 
environmentally constrained amount of calories. We're not going to start with that because it's a cold day like yesterday and rainy and, you know, and I can't find anything to eat and the only thing I can find is grass and leaves and bark, which have no nutrition, but they're great sources of fiber, you know. But it's like, look, I got a bird's egg, you know. <laughs> um, that's how our ancestors lived. You know, we're, I want a, an omelet with uh, some fries on the side and a, a shake. So what's happened is we allow our habit and culture-driven desire for food to drive us to eat. The need for food re goes down as we get older. So culture says, this is what I was trained to eat when I was 18. This is a good meal. This is how I should eat every day. Biology says you're 20, you only need these many calories. You're 30, you only need these many calories. You're 50, you only need these many calories. And the difference between what you eat and what you need is sort as, guess what? That. Now, we were talking about bacteria earlier, and to kind of bring these two things together, one of the things we found is really fascinating is that our colons that have all these bacteria in it play a role in our body shape. There are foods which we cannot digest well, fibers, you know, fruits and vegetables, plants, which is why people prefer to eat meat, because a lot of calories in a small you know, volume. You eat a lot of fruit and vegetables, not that many calories, and most of it is not digestible. But that's the trick, because some bacteria can digest those fibers. So when this, these fibers go down to your colon and they're about to be formed into the nice Lincoln Lux stool we all you know, come to want, uh, some of these bacteria say, excuse me, I need that. And they do. And some of these bacteria are so sweet, they say, would you like some? I mean, we just have all this extra glucose. Here, you take some. So what one person, if they don't have that species of bacteria, would consider wasted, you know, space, fiber, another person looks at as food. Hmm. And so people who, say, don't have one particular species of bacteria will have a lean, leaner body mass because a sizable portion of what they eat goes out as species. For other people, those fibers are turned into food and that can lead them to gain weight. So you can take two twins Give one of them bacteria that can digest some of that fiber, the other one doesn't have them, feed them the same diet, and this person stays really slim, and this person gets obese. So do we have any control over this? Not yet, but there are a number of pharmaceutical like companies that, that are working on it right now. This is actually a huge area that they're looking at in medicine, and, uh, or in, in microbiology and the gut. Back to H. pylori. Right. H. pylori causes all sorts of bacteria that lives with you. Well, one of the things that happens when you have this bacteria is you may not have ulcers, but it does upset your stomach, and it kind of suppresses your appetite. So this bacteria, my mom had H. pylori, and uh, she was from rural Tennessee, and we found this out when she was in her 70s or so. Uh, we got her treated, and she's never had an ulcer or a problem, but it always gave her, quote, a finicky stomach, so she couldn't eat a lot. So she was always thin, mm -hmm. versus her sister, who never had the infection and ate a lot and was not thin. Mm -hmm. So the interaction between bacteria and our bodies actually affects how we look and how we feel. So let's go to, there's this thing called probiotics? Well, probiotics, okay. So isn't that adding, so what, what are, exa what exactly? Well, just to give you some definitions, probiotics are basically microorganisms that have uh, beneficial properties to a human being. I mean, they're bacteria that we live in the official term is a symbiotic organism, the nice way of saying this. We're friends, you know. It's like the bees are our friends. They make honey and we steal it and, you know, we give them flowers and they try not to sing us too much. That's a symbiotic relationship. Right. You know, if you don't put the flowers out, that's just theft. But, okay, if you're giving them flowers, you're giving them something back. Um, these microorganisms that live in us give us things like uh, the microorganisms in your colon produced vitamin K. They produce B vitamins. I mean, your body, you can't do that, but these bugs can, and they say, that's just some cobalamine. I made it for you because you let us live here. Thank you, you're here. Uh, the, uh, and that gets absorbed back, back into, into your body, body so vitamin K. Yeah, and vitamin K. I mean, they, we're friends, mm -hmm. uh, some of these bacteria. But um, sort of uh, back to your question, probiotics are have turned into a form of therapy where you will literally go out and buy bacteria that you want to live in your colon. Now, it's interesting because we're still at the early stages of this, and one of the questions is, are you sure these are the right kind of bacteria? 
Because right. there are a lot of bacterial species, and some of them are our friends. You know, like our friend the beaver, our friend the you know uh, Lactobacillus bacteria, uh, and then there are bacteria that are not our friends, like Salmonella or oh. uh, uh, Shigella or C. difficile, who will kill you dead. Mm. Typhoid fever, for example, um, or dysentery, which is bad diarrhea caused by bacteria of the wrong kind. Cholera kills lots of people. That bacteria is not our friend. I don't want it near me. Whereas, uh, you know, there are some bacterial species which you definitely want. So what pharmaceutical corporations are doing now is that they're actually going out and trying to find out what are good bacteria for you to have. And it's turning into a real adventure because literally you have uh, like 50 to 100 species of bacteria that live in your colon. And these bacteria are very different. They have very different genetics. For example, you have 20,000 genes or so in your body. Uh, uh, that's a lot of genes that manufacture proteins and make you up. You have over 2 million bacterial genes in your body. Mm. And they interact with your cells. So there's this incredible genetic diversity that exists in your colon. And in fact, you can fingerprint people based on the kind of bacteria they have. Right, so I have a question. Sure. It, 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 with all this explanation, we, we only have a, a few, you know, we have a few more minutes, five yeah. more minutes. But isn't uh, in, in your example of your mother and your aunt, isn't it that how do we know when we take a probiotic that we that our bodies need? We don't know that. We don't know that because your body might it's different than my well, body. Well, we know that some bacteria tend to be good. Actors. I mean, it's just like some uh, animal species. I mean, who doesn't love puppies? Mm -hmm. So, you know, dogs as a species, most dogs are, are good dogs. Um, you know, who doesn't love cows? Moo cow. I mean, cows, these are species that we've learned to live with. The same thing with bacteria like, like Lactobacillus is one, which, as the name implies, uh, seems to like milk but, or is passed through milk. And that's, by the way, a prebiotic. A prebiotic is basically some food that uh, encourages bacterial growth of a certain kind. Keep in mind that the best probiotics are the bacteria that are found on foods that are healthy. You know, strawberries, uh, uh, broccoli, avocado, we don't put those through autoclaves when we have them on our salads. We wash them off, mm -hmm. which gets rid of some of the bacterial populations, and then we eat them. So we're not just eating the food, we're eating the bacteria that go along with it, and those bacteria tend to be bacteria that we've you know, gotten along with for 200,000 years. And they help out a Exactly. Now, you, you still need to be careful because there's some bacteria that will hit your eye, like E. coli. Mm. The e. coli is a normal constituent of the human body, but there are, like anything, a few bad actors, and some E. coli are very dangerous. And, you know, if you have a person who's sick and has one of these dangerous strains and you get exposed to that bacteria, it will make you sick. But back to your question on the probiotics, Pharmaceutical companies are trying to figure out which bacteria are good ones to share with people. There are a couple that are on the market that have shown to have some beneficial side effects. Uh, I mean beneficial, I'm sorry, effects in terms of helping with C. difficile infections or possibly helping with inflammatory bowel disease. Mm -hmm. But this is something that we're just learning about and just beginning as a branch of medicine that's really just taking off. Wow. But uh, this is, and we think that this may have an impact on you know, everything from uh, obesity mm -hmm. to uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcer disease we've talked about. So this is a very... In general sense. health. Uh, In general health. health. Right. So, and basically, we get back to my original statement, you eat a healthy diet, uh, dash or Mediterranean, you know, pick your... But it comes down to fruits, vegetables, cut down on... Red good meats, oils. Good oils. Healthy fats. Exactly. Yeah. The good oils stay away from the canola oils, etc. And, uh, and you know, olive oil. You know, virgin olive oil is best, apparently, from what I've read. Um, uh, fish, avocados, uh, nuts. Yeah. Uh, and raw nuts. Raw, raw right. nuts. And in moderation in all things. I mean, you know, even vegetarians can become obese. So eating fewer calories, exercising on a regular basis, moderate. I mean, going for a walk. Right. People who have dogs live longer. Is it because they have the love of a pet? Yeah, maybe. But I don't like walking my wife's dog, but I walk it. And so... Uh, I get exercise I would otherwise not have gotten. So the dogs actually walk on us. Yeah. And I think that... They train uh, us too, I think. They do. But I think at the end of the day, uh, we live in a fascinating world. We're still learning about it. 
common sense usually reigns out simple things, simple diet, you know, mm -hmm. simple exercise, and avoiding really harsh things. Uh, extreme diets are just not a good idea. You mean like fat diets? Yeah, because yeah. well, it's a fat. I mean, right. you know, we were talking about the... It's the, not a lifestyle change. Yeah, the, the Catholic priests in the mid, Middle Ages used to flagellate themselves. They beat themselves to get rid of sins. You know, don't beat yourself. It's not a good thing to do. No. Yeah. No. It's a whole new world. We have one minute left. Okay. How, what can we tell the people in summary of, of all the things that we've discussed about our rainforest in Brazil? Your body is a fascinating, wonderful thing, which, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to study and a pleasure to learn about. Uh, common sense medicine, a healthy diet in moderation, mm -hmm. reducing calories, mm -hmm. uh, upping the exercise, upping exercise, 